Welcome to Just Break Up, the podcast about love, heartbreak, and all the relationship advice you don't want to hear. My name is Sierra DeMolder. And I'm Sam Blackwell. And today we're going to answer a letter from somebody who is anxious about her partner having crushes. But before we begin, we just want to give you our Surgeon General's warning, which is that Sierra and I are not licensed mental health practitioners. I've only no, read not. only one book about anxious attachment styles, <laughs> and I have made an entire career off of it. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so please take our advice as you see fit. We are not professionals. We're not trained in any of this. We are only here to offer our humble musings to hopefully shed some understanding and maybe some laughs about the incredibly rewarding, but mostly confusing experience that is love. All right. Let's get right into today's letter. Today's letter comes from Ella, whose pronouns are she, her, who's writing from 100 Anxiety Avenue. <laughs> Hey, Sam and Sierra, if you get a chance to read this, I want to say that I'm so th grateful for your thoughtfulness and authenticity. Thank you for your compassion and care for all of us through this podcast. I'm a queer cis woman currently in a new monogamous relationship with another lovely woman. Let's call her Iris. I tend to veer on the anxious side of attachment and Iris is more secure, but has some avoidant tendencies. We've been together for about seven months and our first date was 12 months ago. There is so much that I love about our connection. We have so much fun together and our relationship has depth and care and support. I think she's incredibly intriguing and I'm excited to see how our relationship develops over time. Over the past seven months, I've had waves of anxiety about different parts of our relationship. I've been in therapy for years and I continue to use that space as a place to process and find tools to support myself in my anxious attachment. Some of the things that have triggered anxiety have decreased over time. One thing that constantly comes up is the fear of my partner developing feelings for other people. I know that having crushes is normal, as is fantasizing about others. I understand that you can still be attracted to someone else and choose to nurture and grow your own relationship and honor your commitment logically. Yet, even the thought of her developing a crush, something that should be small and harmless, brings up worry and anxiety. I grew up in a really loving family where I thought my parents' relationship was the ultimate goal. They were together for three decades until it came to light that one of my parents had been unfaithful for years, leading to a really challenging divorce. I can't imagine getting through something so painful, and I want desperately to protect myself. I wish I could think of my partner having a crush as something light and inconsequential and trust that she will continue to honor our relationship even if feelings for someone else develop. I hate how this anxiety shows up in my body, how it impacts the way I engage with my partner, withdrawing, and the ways my mind tells me to protect myself from checking for threats to literally just breaking up and staying single forever. How do I get to the point where I can rest assured that Iris being attracted to, desiring, etc. someone does not mean that she will love me any less, want me any less, or compare me to someone else? Or perhaps it's more about learning to be okay with the possibility that this could occur, and I would be okay either way. I really want the intensity of this anxiety to lessen over time and to get to a point where the thought of her crushing on someone is as harmless to me as the thought of her having a new platonic interest. Thank you so much. All right, my darling. Thank you so much for writing and for trusting us with, with this vulnerable question. Uh, I, too, am an anxiously attached cutie who is deeply threatened by the desire, <laughs> by the idea that my spouse could literally, you know, I'm threatened by the fact that she had sex with people before we were together. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Like, I'm threatened by the past. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm here to tell you um, lovingly and confidently that this is something that you are capable of moving through with grace for yourself and for your partner. Um, and I know that sometimes anxious thoughts like this just feel like bottomless and feel like they can swallow you whole. And there's there's barricades that we can put up a you know, you know, between you and these thoughts, there are ways to make these sm thoughts smaller and smaller and smaller until you don't even have to entertain them. It does take work, but I, I think I wanted to start this episode by saying like, yep, see you relate to this, totally get this doesn't make you a bad person. And, um, you're not a freak of nature for feeling this way and you're capable of overcoming these thoughts. This doesn't tell me anything about your relationship, um, you know, being doomed or anything like that. 
but it does require work, right? It requires work to, to, we have to actually face these fears in order to, um, overcome them. Um, so Sam and I are going to give you some perspective and some advice on how to sit with how to actualize some of these thoughts that you know are true, like your partner can have desire for someone else and not act on them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But first, we're going to take a very swift break. All right, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, thank you again for writing to us about this question. You know, I think that there's a lot of folks out there who have really similar feelings of unease and um, distress around the idea that that their partners might develop a crush, might move beyond a crush to to cheating, to whatever, like all of the different places that our our minds go when we are trying to protect ourselves, right? And I think at the core of what you're talking about here is your desire and your want to protect yourself from what happened to your parents, right? And and I think that makes so much sense. Uh, our, our tender hearts are often so afraid of all of the different things that we could imagine happening, all of the different things that we've seen other people go through and feel like we're just, we need to be hyper vigilant. We need to be on constant lookout so that if that bad thing happens, it won't hurt as much, right? The idea of like, I can prevent it from happening. And also if I am constantly aware, then even if it happens, I will have been prepared for it and therefore the pain will be less. And I think that that is so understandable, right? I think that that logic model that we're all following around that is really understandable in such a profound way. And it's also deeply not true. <laughs> like It is like, it makes so much sense and absolutely. And then in actuality, nothing about it is actually rooted in any sort of reality. The, the long and short of it is that no matter how vigilant you are about paying attention to Iris's body language, uh, how Iris is, is texting people, how Iris is talking about other people like that hyper vigilant will not actually prevent Iris from having crushes or from finding another person attractive, or even at the end of the day from doing something outside the bounds of your relationship, right? That hyper vigilance actually isn't going to prevent it because it's actually stuff that you have no control over. <laughs> it is not actually something that you can do much about. And so I just want to name that because I, I want to kind of disrupt the, the, the internal logic that I think our bodies and our hearts and minds follow, which is related to, which is like so relatable in so many different ways and also can like get us in these traps where we're paying attention and trying to fixate on stuff that is like not actually ours and actually preventing us from feeling the feelings that are coming up for us, right? The vulnerability of being in relationship with somebody, how tender it is to say to somebody, I'm offering you my love and affection, and there's no way that I can prevent you from betraying that love and affection. I have to actually sit here and put trust in you as a person who I love and want to be with and in myself that I'm going to be able to handle it if things go wrong here. And that can be so hard to do, especially when we have seen places in which people have been untrustworthy. And especially if we have trouble trusting ourselves enough to be able to think, yeah, if the worst thing happens, I'm, I will figure it out, right? Like I will move through it. I will be, I am capable of holding the pain of whatever bad thing might happen. And I'm actually choosing the possibility of that because I think that this thing, this love, this relationship is so worth it that it's worth risking that bad thing happening. Yes. I love that. And I want to add two ideas um, to that sentiment. One, um, I've said this on the pod before, if you haven't caught it, 
a huge part of that hypervigilance, a huge part of that anxious attachment, that anxiety for me is my nervous system response that tricks me and my body and my brain into thinking that I'm unsafe and that there, that like I need to do something, that I need to check the phone, that I need to observe their body posture. I need to, you know, like our nervous system response makes us feel as though we need to act. Um, and I want to tell you, I want to offer you two things. Number one, just because your body is feeling stressed over this doesn't mean it requires physical a, a reaction, right? Like you can kind of like think about it like a storm, like your body is the boat and the anxiety is the storm and it's going to come through and it's going to pass through you and it's going to make you feel batshit crazy. And you're going to take a couple deep breaths and you're going to wait 10 minutes. You're going to see how you feel after 10 minutes. And then you're going to see how you feel about after 15 or whatever. I, a huge thing for me is realizing like, what the anxiety I'm feeling is, is a current physical manifestation of my fears and it's, and it passes even when the fear maybe is still around, you know, like uh, the immediacy of that nervous system response. Um, and the second thing I want to offer you is a little, um, affirmation that I want you to say to yourself, like, obviously this is deeply tied to what happened with your parents. Um, and, and I want you to say to yourself, this is not the only story, right? This is not the only ending. This is, this is not the only way this goes. Um, yes, infidelity happens and it did happen to your family and it blew up in this way. But I want to remind you that number one, even if infidelity, infidelity happens, it doesn't always happen like that. It doesn't always implode so dramatically and so violently, right? And then and then even better, it doesn't always happen. You know, it's not a guarantee. This isn't, um, this isn't the end, you know, this isn't the ending of every story. Um, and this doesn't have to be mine. Um, Sam offered us that great thing that I still say to myself every day, which is when my anxiety is spiking, I ask myself, um, uh, is it possible? Yes. Is it is it likely? No. Is it possible that your partner has a crush and that crush manifests in such a way that they choose to step outside of the bounds of your relationship or leave you over that crush? Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? Actually, no. You know, we, you're right. You're absolutely right. We all are human animals that get crushes on other people that have desires for more than one body at a time. That is totally normal and not an indication of of, a, of the ending of the story, you know, that's not, that's not telling me what the ending is going to be. And I, and I want to remind you that like, even if she has a crush, even if, she, if your partner develops a crush, the, you know, I would argue like the percentage of crushes that equal action, that equal infidelity or leaving the relationship is probably like what, less than less than 10%. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like for sure. I don't, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> um, <laughs> nor is that something that I don't know if we could actually get some good data on, but, um, I, you're catastrophizing the idea of a crush and not remembering what a crush is. A crush is literally just being like, I like that person. I find them attractive. I I'm drawn to them. Right. Um, and I know, I know your mind and your body and your heart is telling me like, it's way scarier than that. And I, and I get it. It is, but, but just because something is scary doesn't mean that it's true. It just because something feels threatening doesn't mean that it will be threatening. Um, this is not the ending of every story. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that might also be helpful to say to yourself when these like feelings come up, because again, the point isn't to make the feelings go away. <laughs> the point is to, the goal is to like manage those feelings in a way that, that feels productive and healthy and sort of helps integrate and right size them for us. Um, one of the things that I would encourage you to also think about as, as this kind of stuff comes up, right. Is that like, we associate this distress with being unsafe, right? Like I am unsafe. Bad things are happening. It's going to, it's going to hurt me. I know that for a fact. And I want when that to come up for you, when that comes up for you to say to yourself, I'm not unsafe. I'm just vulnerable. 
right? I am choosing vulnerability. I'm in a place where I can be hurt because I'm choosing to open myself to love, to support, to kindness, to connection with people, right? And so you're not unsafe. You are just experiencing the thrill and terror of what vulnerability means, right? The thrill of connection and love with people and the reality of this vulnerability opens me up to the idea that I might be hurt by somebody. And, and I think that that can be, has been helpful for me in moments of panic where I'm like, I'm unsafe. I'm unsafe to put both of my feet on the ground and say, okay, I'm here. I'm present. I'm not unsafe, but I am feeling vulnerable. I am feeling scared. I am feeling really nervous about what's going to happen next, but I'm not unsafe, right? I am in a place of safety. I'm, I'm connected to the present moment and saying, Nothing, nothing like existential is happening right now. And that can help because like the way that our bodies flood is makes us think that literally our lives are in danger. <laughs> like, because that's the response that it's having. It's having a fight or flight response saying there's, there's something out there that's going to literally kill me. And so often that's not true, right? So often it's actually like, oh, no, I'm actually just really nervous that my partner's going to leave me, <laughs> right? Which is terrible and awful. But it, but holding that in, in a different light can sometimes be helpful to like breathe through it and recognize like this is something that I'm experiencing because I am choosing to love. This is something that I'm experiencing because I'm choosing to be in relationship. And it doesn't make me a bad person and it doesn't mean that I'm I'm awful or that I am in any way physically unsafe. It just means that... I'm uncomfortable with how vulnerable this feels and that's okay. It's okay to feel uncomfortable with it. Like I think that even in the most secure relationship, there are folks who feel the discomfort of vulnerability often. And, and that is part of what it means to be in relationship with people. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, the last little tidbit I'll, I'll offer you is, um, per usual, like not related to the topic. <laughs> Love it. Um, uh, I am currently seeing, uh, a registered, I'm currently seeing a registered dietitian. Um, and it's been a really wonderful experience to help me with some of my food anxiety and confusion, um, that I've vaguely talked about here and on some Patreon episodes. And, um, one of the things that the dietitian is helping me do is, um, I, I want, for myself, but also for my child to like be able to have, uh, sweets in the house and have that be a morally neutral thing and, um, teach my child how to listen to her body and, um, n you know, whatever. Anyway. And so one of the things that the dietitian is having me do one of my homework assignments is to buy a bag of candy, <laughs> buy a bag of chocolate. And, um, instead of like, uh, not having any chocolate around my house and then buying a bag and eating the whole bag in like, you know, 30 minutes. Um, she wants me to have chocolate with every meal <laughs> and like every snack <laughs> or whenever I want it throughout the day. And she said, it's, it's literal exposure therapy to take this confusing, scary, coveted thing, um, that I, uh, that I feel so much conflict over and show me that I can have it be a part of my life in an everyday normal way. Um, and show me that, uh, it's not something to be scared of and that I can develop a new relationship to it. One that is one of exposure and indulgence, but also of int intuition and self-care. Um, and, uh, anyway, that's, I won't get into it more, but I just want to say my homework for you, my darling is to, um, do little exposure therapy, right? Like, okay. T you know, once a week, <laughs> I don't know, talk to your partner about, um, your anxieties or, um, tell yourself it would be okay if my partner found this person attractive or, you know what I got that, you know what I started doing with my spouse that now I found, find really fun is like talking about like people on movies that we find attractive and why we find them attractive or whatever. 
I, when I was younger, I wasn't secure enough to do that because I would always take it as a threat or I would always take it as a means to feel insecure, you know? Um, but now it's fun to be like, oh, my wife likes this person because they look this way, um, or whatever. Um, so think about like, I don't, the chocolate slash thinking about your partner having crush parallel isn't totally perfect, (laughs) but I want you to think about it like exposure therapy. The more you have safe, um, the more you have exposure to this idea that you are safe while you are vulnerable, the more you will get used to that discomfort, right? And the more, the deeper you can go into that self-exploration. Does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> did, absolutely. Did I did no, I pull absolutely. that one together? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I think that you did, and I I I think the the thing here is to like normalize that this is hard, right? Like normalize that this anxiety is coming up for you because the idea of our our people leaving us for other people is like a really hard one to sit in, and so how can you normalize that feeling, that emotion for yourself so that when it comes up, it isn't like full blown panic anymore, right? It's not like, oh my God, this must mean something about myself or about how our relationship is. And instead say, oh, there's that familiar feeling. Absolutely. Guess what? I've got a bunch of things that I do when that feeling comes up that help me remember what's true about my relationship or what's true about the world. Right. In the same way that like, there will always be chocolate, right. The so you can think about, yes, absolutely. My relationship isn't limited by the amount of time or my relationship isn't diminished by the idea that my partner has a crush on someone. Right. And I know that to be true. So how do I sit in this feeling, let it pass, let it move through me as opposed to letting it ring 17 alarm bells that actually have nothing to do with the feeling itself and more to do with the, all of the different disparate connections I've made with that feeling that have nothing to do with it, that yeah, are not absolutely. actually tied to it. Yeah. All right, my darling, uh, we love you and we know this is hard and we know you can do hard things. Thank you so much for writing. We hope this helps. We love you. All right, everyone, it is Friday, and on Fridays, we try and set you up with a blind date. This is when we try and send you home with something that we think you're really going to like, and this week, our blind date is... It's a ridiculous movie that my wife and I found incredibly entertaining. It's Lisa Frankenstein. I saw like (laughs) 8,000 ads for it. Like The internet really wanted me to watch it for like months, and then I didn't, and then we watched it the other day because I'm at the time in my life where I can only take serious media so much. So if I'm like reading a really heavy book or if I'm watching a really heavy show, like I would rather have something stupid and light on. Um, And so I suggested this to my wife who loves iconic 80s movies. Okay. So she, this, just to give you a little brief summary of it, Lisa Lisa Frankenstein is like the 80s it's, it's an 80s style reimagining of a Frankenstein story. And it is like, it is a perfect um, impersonation of the movies that came out in the 80s. Like, um, mm-hmm. we can, we can at Barry's or what is that? What's that called? Um, we can at Bernie's, I think. Bernie's. There we go. Yeah. 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 Uh, it was a perfect impersonation of like some of the 80, like the weird 80s science, science sciencey movies like yep mm-hmm. or, or the or the ones that didn't make any sense but were like magical like weekend at bernie's inferno man where like they're based on this thing that like doesn't scientifically make sense but nobody cares sure. you just like go with it <laughs> you know uh-huh. um so she like reincarnates this dead person and then they go on like a murderous you'll see <laughs> but it was like <laughs> it was kitschy it was like a perfect ode to those those 80s style of movies where like they didn't try to over explain themselves and they just had fun with it um great soundtrack like adorable acting i don't know it it was just like funny and cute um so if you want like a light easy funny movie and you like those 80s movies um check out lisa frankenstein on peacock which i have because you gave me your login (laughs) (laughs) i know (laughs) 
Uh, I love it. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like more content from us or if you would like access to our monthly office hours, you can support us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon for as little as $5 a month, you'll get an additional bonus weekly episode. I think this week we answered a letter about helping support a friend who is having a mental health crisis that was... I think very emotional for both of us. So uh, if you're Sam interested in that in content, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I did. If you are interested in that content, you can support us on Patreon for as little as $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash just break up pod. You can slide into our DM, send us your favorite <clears throat> relationship memes, but most importantly, you can submit your questions about all matters of the heart at just break up pod.com. Please remember to like, follow, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review. This literally keeps our mics on and helps us reach more brokenhearted souls who need two random strangers giving them relationship advice. Just Break Up is a production of Duvid Media, original music, recording, editing, producing, all magical things by our good friend Spencer Worth Davis. Make sure to check out his podcasts and his music. And remember, just because it is possible doesn't mean it is likely just because you've seen this story play out in one way doesn't mean this is going to be the same ending for yours. The world contains multitudes and we like to find patterns and reason and, and guaranteed outcomes in our life because the world is full of unknowns. But the truth is we have no idea what is going to happen and we can only lean into the vulnerability of trusting the unknown and if all else fails just break up <laughs>